on full alert. You need to prepare for catastrophic impacts. This is going to be a serious storm. What to expect as Hurricane Milton makes landfall later tonight. Plus, the U.S. is stepping up its support for Israel's ground offensive in Lebanon. A look at the latest as the IDF fights to dismantle Hezbollah in the north and Hamas to the south. And as America marks Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I was pretty much planning to die getting things together for my children. We'll examine the disparity in deaths when it comes to black women and the disease. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Hurricane Milton barrels towards Florida and expected to make landfall tonight. Good evening in Washington, I'm Jenna Browder. As the storm approaches, millions are fleeing its path. Already, wind gusts are reaching up to 145 miles per hour and spawning multiple tornadoes. The Category 4 storm is now on track to be one of the most destructive, according to the National Hurricane Center. CBN's Michelle London is following Milton's path, as well as the latest warnings from state leaders. Michelle? Well, Jenna, good evening. Stay calm and remain in place. That's been the consistent message throughout the day from leaders to people across West Florida. With emergency shelters now overflowing, some in evacuation zones are choosing to stay home. Once the storm makes landfall, however, state leaders stress that calling for help just won't be an option. This is the 11th hour. There's no more fuel. The port is closed, grocery stores are closed. This is when it's time to keep you and your loved ones safe. Shelter in place. A final plea Wednesday as mayors join law enforcement, first responders, and emergency management with urgent warnings and guidance. Please stay safe wherever you're seeking shelter and remain there until you're given the all clear. As Hurricane Milton gets closer, it's bringing a potential storm surge of up to 15 feet heavy rain, possible tornadoes, and wind speeds surpassing 145 miles per hour. Fortunately, thousands of residents are heeding shelter-in-place warnings, with dozens of schools across West Florida turned into emergency shelters. We're going to open three additional shelters to provide more capacity. Buses across the state transporting residents to the nearest vacant shelters. Fire and rescue crews are on standby ready to move in new utility vehicles. They are an all-terrain vehicles that can become amphibious. Consider them humanitarian monster trucks that can reach people in the most difficult situations and locations. For those refusing to leave their homes, consequences could be deadly. You also have to realize that when you make that call for help, I can't imagine what you would feel when you ask for help and it's too dangerous and help's not coming. Don't be that person. We're teaming up with state and local officials to support impacted communities. As support pours into Florida, President Biden and Vice President Harris held a hurricane briefing from the White House, criticizing the spread of false information and warning scammers who might exploit the vulnerable or price gouge that they will be held accountable. And it's harmful to those who need help the most. There is simply no place for this to happen. Now, in order for those in the hurricane's path to stay up to date, Tampa Mayor, Tampa Mayor Jane Castor says residents can text Tampa Ready to 888-777 for alerts. That's 888-777. Jenna. Michelle, we know the storm is predicted to leave widespread damage and power outages across Florida. How are state officials preparing to handle all of this once the storm passes? Well, Jenna, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says thousands of state and local emergency personnel, along with more than 50,000 linemen, are prepared and in sites across the state to save lives and start restoring power as soon as the hurricane subsides. Jenna. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Well, hurricane relief has been a big talking point on the 2024 campaign trail. Former President Donald Trump is taking aim at Vice President Harris over how the Biden administration has handled the aftermath of Helene. And with Florida bracing for Milton, the state's Republican governor is sparring with the Democratic nominee. We have to have an agreement that at some point... We, we all need to work together mm -hmm. to combine resources, especially federal, state, and local resources mm -hmm. around these kinds of disasters. Yeah. And I think it's a shame that um, that hasn't happened. 
After Harris appeared on The View Tuesday, Trump doubled down on his criticism of the Biden-Harris administration in a Truth Social post saying, quote, the worst response to a storm or hurricane disaster in U.S. history with another one coming. Our country cannot withstand four more years of these incompetent fools. In other news, federal authorities have arrested a man suspected of plotting an Election Day terror attack. The FBI says Nasir Ahmad Tawidi was inspired by ISIS to plot an Election Day attack that would target large crowds. Officials say he was taking steps by ordering AK-47 rifles, liquidating his family's assets, and buying one-way tickets for his wife and child to travel home to Afghanistan. Tawhidi is charged with conspiring and attempting to provide material support to the Islamic State and faces up to 20 years in prison. Now to the Middle East. After weeks of silence, President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone for the first time today since August. The details of the call were not immediately available, but the conversation was expected to focus on Israel's plan to retaliate against Iran for last week's missile attack. The meeting came as Israel's defense minister issued a new warning to Tehran. Our attack will be lethal, precise, and above all, surprising. They will not understand what happened and how it happened. They will see the results. Relations between Jerusalem and Washington have been tense in recent weeks. Israel is ramping up the war in Gaza despite U.S. calls for de-escalation. The IDF says it is pounding the strip to prevent a Hamas resurgence. Dozens have reportedly been killed in the fighting. Meanwhile, on Israel's northern border, fierce clashes between the IDF and Hezbollah continue to escalate. Brad Bowman is here with us now. He is the senior director of the Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Brad, welcome. So Israel has essentially decapitated Hezbollah by taking out the organization's top leaders. What do you think is Israel's end game here? I think Israel's primary objective is to end uh, the attacks uh, on Israel that started on October 8th, the very day after the horrific October 7th attack of Hamas, so that tens of thousands of Israelis can return to their homes. Uh, that's the objective, and that means destroying Hezbollah positions, uh, weapons depots, uh, and tunnels at least south of the Latani River. And uh, hitting uh, those uh, targets from the air is relatively easy for Israel as it enjoys air supremacy, but going in with the ground warfare is going to be tougher and take longer to do. Yeah. Um, Hezbollah, of course, a, a proxy of Iran. Israel has been reluctant, though, to give details to the U.S. about its plans to strike Iran. Why is that, Brad? And, and what do you make of this lack of communication between Netanyahu and Biden? You know, it's, it's interesting. We really see, I would say, somewhat of a dichotomy between the political level communication and communication at the military level. The military to military relations between the Department of Defense and Israel Defense Forces um, and, and, and the relationship more broadly are just incredibly deep, comprehensive, and positive. And uh, those communications that go back decades and have been particularly uh, robust in, in recent uh, months, of course. Um, there's obviously been some tension between President Biden and, and Netanyahu. Uh, that's to be expected on some level. Uh, some in Israel may be concerned uh, that sharing their plans with the U.S. government, their plans for a response to Iran's second unprecedented, unprecedented direct attack on Israel, might lead to the Biden administration trying to constrain or minimize Israeli actions. But from the perspective of the United States, earlier notice is helpful in that it will allow the U.S. forces to position themselves to help defend Israel and also to protect themselves. Brad, does it concern you that if, if Israel doesn't give Washington a heads up about a potential Iran strike and what that might mean for, for U.S. troops and, and protecting them? You know, the, the threat to American troops is the Islamic Republic of Iran and its proxy networks that have conducted more than 177, 78 attacks on U.S. forces since October 17th. That's the threat to U.S. forces. I would be seriously surprised if there's not some sort of an, uh, advance notice from Israel. Uh, you know, uh, Israel is our, our best ally in the Middle East, and America is Israel's indispensable ally. So I think there will be advance notice. How long in advance and how detailed that is is an open question. Um, but I, I'm not particularly concerned about this. And I think some of this is uh, not you all, but the media trying to make more of, of political turmoil in an election year and kind of missing the fact that there is deep and broad communication between the United States and Israeli militaries. Yeah, it goes much deeper than just Netanyahu and Biden, right? right. Um, so Iran warns that if Israel strikes its oil facilities or nuclear sites, 
it's going to respond by attacking Saudi Arabia, potentially, of course, triggering a regional war. Uh, but Iran's foreign minister met with Saudi, uh, Saudi officials in Riyadh today. Um, what's the goal of this visit, Brad? And is it a sign that it, Iran is trying to prevent further escalation in the region? It's a good question. You know, this is not the first time, of course, that the Islamic Republic of Iran has threatened Saudi Arabia. In fact, Iran has directly attacked uh, targets in Saudi Arabia many times since 1979, including the, Ab the strike on the Abqaiq oil facility that had a significant impact on global oil markets. Um, and, of course, Iran helped arm the Houthis, who for years would launch missiles at uh, Saudi cities and civilians. So this is the not... Not the first time we've seen these sorts of Iranian threats, and it's a reminder that the leading threat to regional stability is the Islamic Republic of Iran. But in this meeting, they discussed Lebanon and Gaza, of course, and there's also these warnings about not using military bases in Saudi Arabia against Iran. Um, uh, but we've seen that from uh, Qatar as well. Um, this is a bit par for the course from, from Tehran. Yeah. All right, Brad Bowman with FDD. Always good to get your expertise, Brad. Thank you so much. Thank you. And coming up, faith in action. How churches in North Carolina are stepping up to help victims of Hurricane Helene. Welcome back. House Speaker Mike Johnson visited North Carolina today to survey the damage left by Hurricane Helene. It's been more than a week since the storm carved a path of destruction through the state. Search and rescue teams are still looking for missing people. This is more than 80 organizations urge Congress to return from its pre-election recess and pass more FEMA funding. Last week, the government warned that FEMA does not have enough money to make it through hurricane season but that the agency can still meet immediate needs. In this crucial time, churches and faith-based groups are stepping up to meet basic needs like food and water. As CBN's Brody Carter reports, they are also giving much-needed hope. Shocking scenes left behind from Hurricane Helene. This is just a glimpse of what the destruction looks like. That damage spanning more than 400 square miles throughout several states. We're currently in Swannanoa, North Carolina. It's just outside of Asheville. And despite all of this damage, neighbors, volunteers from states over, including the faith community, they're coming together to help those desperate in need while salvaging what's left. Oh, yeah, uh, we're Swannanoa. not going anywhere. Yeah. It's Swannanoa. With just over 5,000 people, this small mountain town makes the list of those worst affected by Helene. That river has usually been just a nice little river. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, and it, it turned into a massive, it was uh, some 27, 30 feet above flood stage, uh, places where no one had ever seen it. The view of the disaster zone is jarring, with utility line poles snapped in half, roads and railroads washed out, and only concrete slabs where homes once stood. Found out their, their house is gone. Uh, they don't even know where it is. Um, it literally rushed down the river. Senior Pastor Jeff Dowdy of First Baptist Church of Swannanoa says the town's river turned into a tour de force rising just yards away from the church building. We were able to make it through as a church, so we feel like that God has spared us to be able to be a beacon of hope in this community. Just to the north, another grassroots effort has turned into a massive distribution center in Asheville. So we've been trying to keep track of the needs so great, our inventory, we're just sending it. Michelle Coleman, founder of the Asheville Dream Center, is set up outside Revel Church, providing water, food, and supplies for more than 40 nonprofits and churches. All right, we start bringing some fruit. My best friend told me about this place this morning. Yeah. I mean, it's allowed me to get toilet paper, which I don't have any. What began with giving a single case of water quickly turned the church into one of the town's main distribution centers for locals. It's mostly fresh fruit. It's like we've been only getting canned stuff and it's getting kind of old. It's allowing them to reach even the most remote communities, many of which have been cut off by the storm's aftermath. So many donations have come in that they're sending supplies back out to newly created extension sites in other towns. So right now, I mean, we're getting semi-trucks in here. We're loading it and we have, now I can say this, over 60 nonprofits, churches, businesses, recovery centers and neighborhoods that we are getting this out to. Michelle says they've heard there's government aid, although they haven't seen it here yet. I don't know. I've heard they're here. Yeah. I've heard they're here. None of none of us have seen them. Refusing to wait, she's been able to create this constructive chaos through the work of many survivors joining in 
to bring hope to the hopeless. There's a flood that's in our history in 1916. Um, grandparents of some of my members would talk about this, that uh, the things that happened then, you know, nobody had ever seen this. So to have it happen now, they'll be talking about the flood of 2024 for generations to come. Helicopters have been flying overhead nonstop. They're delivering supplies to folks that are still trapped in the mountains. They're waiting for rescue teams to clear roads of trees and debris. And in spite of all this unimaginable loss, survivors say that they're finding hope in their shared faith and resilience in one another. Brody Carter reporting in Western North Carolina, CBN News. Much Brody. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing continues working to bring aid to the hardest hit victims of Helene. To learn more about their work and how you can help, please visit OB.org. Up next, black women 40% more likely to die from breast cancer than white women. Why the disparity and what can be done about it? Next on Faith Nation. Welcome back to Faith Nation. Well, breast cancer is rising among women under the age of 50. A recent report from the American Cancer Society reveals breast cancer rates among that age group have increased 1.4% every year from 2012 to 2020. Researchers point to estrogen as part of the problem. Girls are starting their periods at a younger age and women are delaying having children. That means more cycles and more surges in estrogen. But doctors say you can still lower your risk by reducing alcohol consumption and maintaining a healthy weight. Deaths from cancer have fallen by one-third since the 1990s overall. But there's a big disparity when it comes to breast cancer. Black women are 40% more likely to die from the disease than white women. Medical reporter Lori Johnson explains why and what's being done to save lives. 11 years ago, at age 32, Sherry White noticed something unusual. One day I just touched my chest, and it was actually like right here, and I felt a lump. She immediately went to the doctor. You do have to pay attention to yourself and never write things off as this, oh, it's nothing, it'll go away. Who diagnosed Sherry with a fast-growing type of breast cancer. So I was pretty much planning to die getting things together for my children. But she didn't die. Sherry quickly pursued the best treatment available and trusted Jesus. And without that, you can't do anything. Without God, you can't do anything. Sherry also credits God for prompting her to start the support group, My Sister's Keeper, so more black women could be in a better position to experience a successful outcome like hers. He used this ordeal that was very tra traumatic to help me to create an organization that will help other women get through cancer. Overall, cancer death rates have fallen by a whopping one third since the early 1990s. But when it comes to breast cancer, there's a huge racial gap. Black women are 40% more likely to die from the disease than white women. Doctors say there are lots of reasons for this disparity. One is that black women are more likely to have the type of breast cancer with a lower survival rate due to genetics, lifestyle, or both. African-American women have a much higher um, rate of uh, what's called triple negative breast cancer, which is a more aggressive form of breast cancer. Uh, African-Americans tend to get this two to three times, uh, at a two to three times higher rate than they do in their white counterparts. This may explain why when black women receive a breast cancer diagnosis, it's 10% more likely to have metastasized or spread beyond the breast compared with white women. That plus the fact that breast cancer strikes more black women at younger ages, many doctors recommend mammograms early and more often. So therefore screening, particularly starting screening at, at least at the age of 40, I think is extremely um, important. They should do it annually and that should be true of all black women. If a mammogram shows something abnormal, follow-up tests are needed to determine whether it's cancer. Statistics show black women experience longer wait times for those tests and also the necessary treatment if cancer is found. In addition, fewer black women receive the type of treatment they need, such as surgery, radiation, and hormone treatments. Dr. Lisa Richardson, the CDC's Director of Cancer Prevention, 
tells CBN News black women have fewer social and economic resources, including suboptimal access to medical care that leads to poorer outcomes, including death. Richardson says the center's goal is to increase the number of women receiving cancer screening tests, as well as good quality follow-up after abnormal results. As part of that goal, a CDC program helps women with lower incomes and no insurance get access to these services. Meanwhile, organizations like My Sister's Keeper try to educate and empower women of color. We have big sisters and we have little sisters. So our big sisters are women who actually went through cancer treatment, been there, done it. Um, and our little sisters are the ones who's recently diagnosed. So our big sisters help to be that coach, if you will. So while black women are far more likely to die from breast cancer than others, it doesn't have to be that way. By raising awareness among communities of color and within the medical system, more can survive, like Sherry. At the end of the day, you will have an amazing story to tell um, about your, your, your accomplishments of an overcoming cancer. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And coming up, an unexpected train station visitor next on Faith Nation. Finally tonight, a cute and curious escapade caught on camera. Security footage at a train line in Australia chronicled the adventures of a koala wandering around the station. The marsupial was caught crawling under the fence onto a platform early in the morning, venturing dangerously close to the railway. A security guard on a passing train noticed the koala and warned other trains to slow down when passing the station. Police arrived shortly after to corral the animal back to safety into nearby bushland. He's very cute. I'm very glad he's okay. We are going to leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for this Wednesday edition of Faith Nation. We hope you have a great night, and we will see you right back here tomorrow.